Learn to fly the Grumman F4F-4 Wildcat Warbird. Hi everybody, I'm Howard from Florida Learn to Fly. Let's get into this airplane and learn how to handle it properly. You can read the standard disclaimer that I put in here to make sure you understand this is not for real airplanes at all. This is for flight simulation of any kind of flight simulator you can use from your home. I'm just sharing my knowledge using my teaching techniques. Now you notice here we're using this uh, scenery behind me here. It's um, World War II Naval Station. And you can see in here, this is the Midway area, beautiful area that has um, a naval base and an aircraft carrier nearby that I've added in, the Lexington. And um, I think it's the Lexington from Orbix. And then it's this um, midway from flightsim.to. Those are the two things. I think I've got some mention of that further on. And uh, it makes it more realistic. You certainly don't need either one of those things to go and fly this plane flight at your favorite airbase. So I gave this as a first look here on YouTube, and I also gave it as a lesson on my Twitch channel. And uh, we got a pre-release version f and from Got Friends, and we rung it out completely and followed its progress right up to its release. It's now officially released as of this recording, as of yesterday. So now it's available for purchase. Here's this the uh, Lexington that I added in from Orbix, and then the Midway Scenery from FlightSim.to. We're going to land there a couple of times and see how it goes. So let me introduce to you the F4F-4 Wildcat. Now there's a difference here. I'm not going into the history of all the different versions, but before this version, <clears throat> the version that was on Pearl Harbor, the, the version that was the, the most plentiful of these airplanes on Pearl Harbor, was the F4F-3. And the F4F-3 had fixed wings. And a big difference here is the folding wings, as you can see from this picture here. And you can animate that. There's a switch to unfold them. There's a switch to fold them back up again. And this was, of course, for use on carriers. So it also has the hook, the tail hook, which we can em employ and we can use. And it also has, this plane features uh, a catapult function. So you can catapult off any carrier. You can catapult off any runway just for the practice. So you can do this um, catapult and capture uh, anywhere. And that's a really nice feature that Orbix has added in there. Available from gotfriends.com and the MSF Marketplace for PC and Xbox. Now, I'll mention to you that the gotfriends.com version, the website version, has working guns and working bombs. And the one on the marketplace doesn't because of the marketplace policies, of course. These bombs and guns don't hurt anything. They don't blow up anything. They don't do damage. But it's a nice animation. And it actually lets you test your skill. You can drop the bombs anywhere you want and practice doing that. That's not the main focus of getting this airplane, the main focus of this session, although I will demonstrate that near the end of the demonstration, the main focus here is actually flying the plane, handling the plane. As you can see here now, maybe I'll just uh, pull off um, pull off my, my video for a second here. The, uh, the Grumman F4F Wildcat, carrier-based fighter aircraft, 1940, first entered service. Um, I think as, as early as 37, 38, they were testing with earlier versions of this, the one, two, and three, and then here on and, uh, the Dash 4. I think it was also one of the first airplanes or the first airplane to have retractable landing gear too. And you can see right through to the other side and they've actually done very well with modeling this inside this uh, version from Got Friends. The Wildcat was was the only Navy fighter in production through the entire war. A total of almost 8,000 were made. Pretty amazing statistics there. So here you can see in the sim where you would pick it up, it's the Grumman, and there's a number of different liveries you can grab for Xbox and PC. Now, simple layout. We want to go through a couple of these things. Um, I actually did put on my leather hat and my mustache just for the lesson, and I played some nice 40s music, 40s jazz music big band music from back in the day when I did the lesson. Lots of fun, you guys. But here, seriously, I'm just taking a look at a few things. Along the way, we're going to point out some things, but I'll tell you, the manual is so well done, we're not going to recreate everything that the manual has. But the three main things here, first, I'm going to give you three suggestions. First is check your power bindings first. 
power bindings are needed in your home cockpit. Whether you're using a yoke or a stick, a stick is certainly preferred, but the actual power levers, the, the standard propeller, throttle, and mixture lever. And th that's where these are on your left hand in the cockpit. Right? And these are handy because you need these at all phases of flight and adjustments throughout your flights, as you may know already. Put your throttle quadrant in your left hand and your stick in your right. Now you may configure your bombs after you learn to fly it, but we'll talk about those bindings right here. So map your guns to set pedestal light. So that's the actual trigger right there for your guns. I've got that on the red finger switch of my stick. And then uh, my bombs are toggled to cabin lights and it's on an extra switch that I have. And uh, you can see in here, here's our two guns and bombs uh, mappings. Also, this lever is for tail hook for carriers. I haven't mapped it to anything. I can just reach down and click it with my mouse and it slides back or it slides forward. This is your, your tail hook for when you're landing on carriers or you want to land quickly. All right? Don't get that confused uh, with the tail wheel lock. That's below this. All right, two different things. Tail wheel lock for takeoffs and landings and this lever for the tail hook for carrier landings. All right, so here's the, the whole list of the uh, things that you can map here. Um, as you can see, we've only done two of them. And some people, will they've got enough switches in their home cockpit, they can map a lot of things if they wish. So that's just giving you an idea of what's available. You can um, set these all up. You can pause on the screen and do it. All right, technical specifications here. Now you can see, uh, again, I'm in the way, but I'll move out of the way every time. I just want to come in once in a while and say hi, but... You know, the technical specifications here, first flight was in 1941 for this model, the Dash 4, and uh, carrier-based Pratt & Whitney R1830 Twin Wasp Radio. This is a very popular engine used in a lot of airplanes, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's some statistics on the weight and the length and the wingspan. <clears throat> 20,000 foot ceiling, does have oxygen on board for the pilot, of course, at that altitude. Cruises up to 318 miles per hour and uh, payload six times 50 cal guns and two times 100 pound bombs underneath the wing. So, and it can also carry external fuel pods. All right, the Pratt & Whitney 1830 Twin Wasp. Before we get into the seven steps to learn to fly the thing, we just wanted to learn a little bit about the plane. Um, this is a twin row 14 cylinder radial engine. Now, this is the same engine used in the DC 3 and many other airplanes. The DC 3 has two of these things, one on each wing. Uh, you know, also a very famous plane. This, uh, this particular engine has two rows of seven cylinders. So you can see in here uh, seven cylinders on the front row that are the closest to us. And behind that, just behind that, you'll see another row which is also turned so that you can so that they can get full air coming at them also. This is an air-cooled engine. That's what all those fins are. And what we're seeing is it's coming right through to here. So what we're doing is, uh, what they're doing is putting two layers of seven. Now, Pratt & Whitney has done all the way up to four layers of seven. And I believe that was the, uh, that was the Pratt & Whitney engine that they have in the Spruce Goose. And they ended up with eight of those engines, but they had four layers. And the back layers couldn't get enough air. They were getting pretty warm. But uh, that's how it's designed. And this is modeled really well in the sim. Two-stage centrifugal type supercharger. Now in the sim that kicks in at 5,000 and 10,000, I think the supercharger kicks in to help us with those altitudes. Um, all right. Each engine dry weight, 1250. All right. So that's interesting to know. Let's go take a look at weight and balance before you start up your, before you go into fly, you'll go to this screen first. As you adjust the pointer, it starts at 50%, gives you your numbers, and it shows you that you're within the CFG limit. The forward and aft limit in here is very tiny. Do you notice that? Now, you can't, no matter what you do here with the bomb, left bomb, right bomb, it doesn't do anything to the sim. Um, you have to add those bombs with switches inside the sim once we're in the cockpit. You can adjust this all you want. Here I have my external tanks attached, so it's letting fuel be in them. If you don't have them attached, they'll be back to zero, all right? And you can attach them and fill them right in the sim. All right, learning a new airplane. Here's the seven steps, you guys. And these are the seven steps I go through in all planes, and they're based on in real life. 
when I went to do a type certification on a 172, I learned on a 150, and uh, I went to a Cessna 172 and I had to do type certification. In other words, I had to take an instructor with me, I had to study the POH, I had to get to know the plane, and then be very confident with it enough to be able to be certified, stamped in my logbook, or in my uh, um, pilot certificate document that I'm certified for this plane. The same thing here. So I've taken the same seven steps that I always did with other planes in real life. And really the first thing you do is look for that pilot's operating handbook and find it. Here in the sim, we're lucky that Got Friends gave us a manual that's perfectly fine. You don't need the POH. The POH is a thicker manual for the real planes and you can extract anything you'd ever want in there. That's what we typically do in the real planes, but not here. We don't have to do that here. So uh, Godfriends has done a really great job of making a manual for us, but we get some kind of manual and we learn about vital speeds. We learn about anything that's in that manual. And especially here in the sim, things that are specific to the simulator version, things that they've had to make shortcuts on. For instance, we can turn on smoke so that we can have a smoke trail for aerobatics. And also we can also uh, turn on a switch that lets us catapult off the runway or off the carrier. And so, you know, those things are extra things they would put into the sim version that you wouldn't find in the real thing, right? Step number two, learn the vital speeds, the V speeds. V doesn't stand for vital, but that's, that, that's what they're called, V speeds. Some say they stand for velocity. That's not true either, but you know, the point is they're called V speeds. You'll see V S O V. Um, different letters afterwards, and that just means the speeds that the plane is rated for. We'll look at those and what those are. Learn how to handle twin engines if equipped. So we don't have to do step number three. I should gray that out here. Um, many planes I do cover in this series do handle twin engines, and we have to know how to do that. Number four, make a checklist. There's one built right in to the manual from Got Friends. Learn about the blue knob propeller lever. Now I'm going to elaborate a bit on this because so many people ask questions afterwards. When I do these videos, I've done a complete lesson on the blue knob, a lesson on what exactly does that do. I'm going to give you a few of those pictures that I did in that lesson just to get a feel for what that's all about. If you already know about this and you're used to flying with a propeller lever, you can scrub through that part. All right. Um, in number six here, now this is the one where we typically take a ton of photos and show you everything and label them. But Godfriends has done that so well in the manual then I'm not going to repeat it. So I'll show you an overview of the cockpit, talk about a few things, but in the demonstration, I'll go and click switches in the demonstration, right? So we don't have to spend so long here with pictures here. Take it for a spin and get to the practice area at altitude and get comfortable. And this is important. You'll never get to know a plane well just by studying the manual. You'll never get to know it well by watching others. You got to fly it, right? And that's what we're going to be doing here too. We'll go through all these steps. Um, so we'll use the Got Friends flight manual for this. We'll go and show you a few of those pages. Here's one of the liveries that they made the last minute. And uh, my co-host Andrew suggested this one. And uh, they got right at it and put it in before it was actually released. So this is pretty cool. But here's the things we got to do, you guys. Cockpit orientation. Map the controls, which I've talked about. Takeoff and landing. How's that happen? It's a tailwheel with a lot of power. Cruise settings while you're cruising along, going somewhere. And then engine management. How to actually manage the engine. And we're going to take a look at that. In real life, read the whole manual, highlight the important parts, make checklist cards and understand it from top to bottom. You really got to know the plane. And you know, you hear people going, you know, be the plane and all this kind of stuff. But really after you've flown a plane for a while, you really get comfortable with it. You know the hum of the engine. Or you, you could tell the RPMs before you even look at the gauge. Um, you can tell when something's wrong, the sound of the engine, the roughness of the plane, the vibrations. Um, Things like that, the speed that you're going. I shouldn't be going that fast. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to have my gear down. You know, and my point is also that in all flying, always use checklists, always. All right, you're gonna forget something, we're human. And a lot of the accidents you look at in real life, it's because a pilot wasn't using a checklist. It's human error, it's something they did wrong. All right, and so use your checklist to avoid error. I found things that, oh yeah, that, click the switch and things are better. All right, so um, I already mentioned this, I guess, so I shouldn't have mentioned it here, but put the levers in your left hand and put that stick in your right hand because the levers are all over on the left, right? And so you can interchange. You can put your left hand on the lever and then, uh, you know, adjust things over on the right side of the plane. But typically your hands would be on the levers, especially during landing and takeoff. In typical flight school fashion, you're told to always keep your hand on the throttle in the last 500 feet as you're landing in case you have to go around. 
Also, we leave our propeller lever full in and our mixture full in in case we have to do a go around. So we have our hand right on the lever on our last 500 feet going in and our first 500 feet coming out in case we have to abort, in case we have to do something else. We're ready for it. We're not fumbling around trying to find stuff. So it's important that you have this set up properly and our levers are on the left. So that's how you would do it. All right, step number one, obtain the pilot's operating handbook. There is a POH, but the Wildcat manual that comes with it, if you look into your Got Friends folder, if you can, if you're on an Xbox, then just go here, gotfriends.com slash pages slash flight manuals, and you will find the flight manual. And it is done so well. I'm showing some pictures here. I'm not breaking copyright laws. I got permissions from Got Friends to show some samples of their pages. I'm certainly not handing you the manual, but you can go get it yourself, all right? And you can have all the pages in all their glory. Here's one of the pages. I've got about three altogether. I'll show you. But here's one of the pages that's very important, the V speeds. All right, now, if you've ever studied airplanes at all, you'll understand what some of these are. VY is your normal climb out. If there were a VX on here, that would be your steep climb out over a 50 foot art, um, obstacle. So we're trying to look for, you know, we're looking for these important things, VY, 125 knots. That's what we're looking for. Where's 125? And I put the picture here to give you some familiarization. The first 50 knots are the inside dial and you're not even flying yet. I think uh, if I look on here, I think it's 69, VSO is 69, but I think your takeoff is 70, right? So, you know, we're not even flying until 70. So we're going to see the needle go all the way around. We're not going to fixate on it. We're going to be watching out. We're going to be keeping alignment with the runway. We're going to keep the stick back. And we're going to glance down. We're glancing down. It's still on the inside one. Still coming around here. Glancing. Okay, we're getting ready for takeoff. It feels like we're getting ready for takeoff. The vibration of the plane. The tail's trying to lift. I'm holding the tail on the ground. And around 70 here, as you can see here, around 70, all of a sudden, oh, we're off. And we're in the air up come the gear all right and so um flaps are vacuum controlled from the engine suction which is a lot of things in the plane that do that they will not drop when you're above 130 knots i thought i mentioned that you don't use flaps for takeoff at all flaps are only to slow you down a heck of a lot of drag throw those barn doors down and stop that plane so you're gonna have to watch this on final i learned quickly enough through experimentation and in the sim that's what it's for I've come in with normal flaps. I usually drop flaps when I'm in downwind. I drop one flap turning to base. I drop a second flap coming in on final and, if, and more flaps if I need it, if I have to come over an obstacle or I'm trying to do a steep approach. Here, I found that once flaps are down, you are giving it as much power as possible just to stay afloat. And so it really does, it goes all the way down and it really does cause a lot of drag. You know, much like the Spitfire flaps are the same thing. They have split flaps also. They go down to something like 96 degrees, 93 degrees, something like that. Almost a complete perpendicular. The flaps come down and they just give you all that drag. Wow. So you got it. You know, it's certainly great for coming to a stop as soon as possible. But be careful with your flaps on approach. All right. Uh, v and E is never exceed 430 knots. So you're going to do a dive bomb on something, on a ship or something, and practice the bombs that are built in. Uh, make sure you don't exceed 430 knots. You might have to throw the flaps out, right? Now, the flaps won't work when you get up that fast anyway, so <laughs> go ahead and try. But some people are doing that. So you're going to have to control that with power for sure as you do your, your descents. All right, so the vital speeds here um, for cruising. Once you're cruising, you know, we already saw around 70 we're taking off. We saw in there um, your stall speed. Sorry, come back a second. Your stall speed here, VSO. Here's your stall speed, 59. VSO, uh, this is your flaps out, your stall speed with flaps out, 69. That doesn't seem right. Seems the other way around. VS is stall, 69. The lower one should be with flaps out. But uh, we'll go experiment with that. I'm actually surprised to see that. VSO is flaps out, and that should be a lower stall speed, but we'll see how that goes. Should be the other way around maybe this is right out of their manual maybe i'll have to ping them and just see what's going on there so cruise settings you guys maximum cruise but economical cruise this is what i usually use unless i'm in a hurry to get to my destination 30 and 2200 now i've already seen another poh that says 29 and 21 so you know around there all right as you can see from these diagrams here here's our manifold pressure here i am almost at 30 actually it looks like 80 but it's actually 30. i'm at 28 and a half or so and I'm sitting here at the RPM at 2 plus almost 100, 2100 RPM and 28. So almost there. 
All right, I just took the screen snap and I realized I should take it while I'm up to cruise. Um, and then you're looking at your speed from there, all right? But really, this is what you're doing. Uh, um, cylinder head temperature, 180 degrees normally. And I see it right now, it's sitting at uh, temperature here, 180 degrees Celsius. If this is Celsius, I'm sitting at 80. Huh, that's nice and cool. That's not 180, that's 80. Huh. Down here is your pressures in pounds. Uh, I must be idling right now, you guys sitting at 80. So uh, pressure in pounds here, this is your fuel pressure on the lines, this is your oil pressure, and they're both good. They don't use green, yellow, and red like they do in modern day instruments today. So it would be handy because then you could just glance at it. Same with this, kind of strange that, you know, when the needle's there, you got to look and see is, is, is a little needle inside or, you know, whatever. But that'll work anyway. We got the idea how it works. And now we know how to do cruise. We'll pull back both. All right, get her, make a checklist. I'm keeping it pretty fast paced here, you guys. You want to get to the demo. You want to actually see the plane. We already did a first look where you primarily just take the plane out for a spin. But this is more of a deeper dive. And here you should be taking more time than I am here in the video. I'm trying to keep our lessons in the video on, on YouTube down to around an hour or less. And to do that, I've got to go pretty quickly through it. But stop where you need to and go back and look at stuff or scrub ahead if you've already been there before. All right, I do actually print my checklists and laminate them like I do in real life, and I keep them in the cockpit. Now, I also have them back up on my iPad, and I have a backup on my phone. And so I have them in three places if I need them. But that piece of paper in front of you, in front of your face, instead of holding an electronic device, instead of flipping to find it in your electronic device, is so handy. And I tuck it under my leg, between the leg and the seat, every time. And that way I can just reach down, whip it, whip it, and then look at it and do what I need to do, all right? You do get complete checklist pages in the Got Friends manual that comes with the airplane. When I first checked out this airplane, there wasn't a manual yet, so I had to go find a POH. And uh, in there, I found the checklist. But they've got all the checklists here. I'm just showing you one here. They've got them all. I don't want to show all of them to you. Um, it's nice of them to let me show you some of the manual, but uh, you can certainly open the manual, you guys. Anyone can go get it. Now, this is an interesting picture. This was just recently given to me by Got Friends because I was wondering about the label here. And in their next update, they're going to fix this label. It seems to have the same thing as the pull on both of them. All right. And I noticed that and I thought, hmm, there's something wrong there with that label. But, you know, this is the blue lever. And this is what we need to learn about. And I'm going to elaborate on this. So you might want to scrub ahead if you already know about this lever and you're fine with it. All right, but the next few pages, I do want to dwell on this because it's the biggest confusion for most people who have a blue lever in the plane they're flying. Where do I put it? What do I do with it? I have no idea what to do with this thing. And you could, you know, you look in the checklist and a lot of times the checklist says as required. And you look at it and go, what's as required like what? What do I do with it? So let's go have a look at this, you guys. And I also want to give you a demonstration of what that propeller looks like when I get down into the plane. All right. So let's learn what this is. Now, this is right near your left hand. It's over there on the left. Your main your main dials are all up here to the right, just down here on the left. And your, your uh, throttle and your mixture are just behind it back here. But I wanted to, you know, this is a beautiful zoomed in picture of what it is. And in your home cockpit, it'll be your blue lever. Or on your Bravo, it'll be your blue lever that slides up and down, right? So let me just bear with me while I go through this, because this really clears it up for a lot of people. I gave a whole lesson on this, a whole two and a half hours lecture on this. And people thought after that it was clear as a bell. Let me break it down into five minutes or seven minutes. Let's see how that works. So in a Cessna 172, for example, in many GA planes that we fly today, they have a fixed pitch propeller. In other words, there is no way to change the pitch. It's set at a specific angle. And you notice that this isn't straight up and down. We're looking at it. We're looking straight on where you mount it to the plane. But you notice that this propeller blade is tilted that away. This propeller blade is the same exact tilt as this one, but only we're seeing the other side of it. So they tilt the blades to make the maximum efficiency in cruise. And this is important to know, you guys, the maximum efficiency in, in cruise. And what that means is the, the, the majority of your flight will be in cruise. So they make the, the blades for that. If this were a stall plane, a short takeoff and landing plane, and you were going to use this for just stall competitions, you might even have two propellers. One is for cruise to get to the event if you're actually going to fly your plane. And the second propeller you're going to snap on is when you're actually doing the competition, which might have a bigger bite because you need the bigger bite. In other words, you need a different pitch. 
So some people will have more than one propeller, but that's a lot of work. You can see all these bolts have to be installed. They have to be torqued properly and then there's safety wire put on them. And you don't want this thing leaving the airplane, of course. So that's way too much work to go in and change the blade every time you want to change the pitch. So because this is a fixed pitch and it's made for cruise, for cruising operations, for the normal cruise that you're going to do, that's the most efficient, um, then it can only work up to a certain altitude. And then that pitch is just not biting enough air to give you enough thrust, not biting enough air to be able to have you um, climb even higher. And so, you know, typically the Cessnas that we see, the non-pressurized Cessnas without oxygen, they could go to 15,000 feet. You shouldn't stay up there too long if you're not used to it. So they invented way back then, you can see these are war era airplanes with variable pitch propellers, all right? So variable pitch in a propeller, we're changing the pitch of the blades while we're in flight. We're not getting out on the ground and taking a wrench and changing that propeller. We're actually changing the pitch using a lever, either a push-pull lever, like in this plane, and even in the Cessnas, it's a push-pull lever. If you have a Cessna, the, 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 the bigger numbers as you move up in the, in the numbers, you get a Cessna that has that blue lever push-pull, all right? As the air gets thin, we can change the pitch for the thinner air. In other words, take a bigger bite out of the air as we cruise higher. That's what's happening here. So it really is simple, you guys. And my little simple diagram here that I tried to make in this presentation here, we're showing you the lever that you grab and pull down or up, but it could very well be the lever you push all the way in or pull all the way out, all right? And as we return back to ground, we change the pitch back to normal. So believe it or not, takeoff and landing are firewalled. They're right against the wall, pushed all the way into the wall, or the levers pushed all the way to the wall, all right? And in this case, a lot of them are actually standing straight up. That They can't go any further. The wall is right there in front of them, all right? The wall is right there in front of them. And then you pull them back at some degree, depending on what RPM you want at cruise, all right? That's what it's for. And the higher you go, this lever will be probably pulled back even further because it has to give you more pitch, more bite as you get into that thinner air. So right there, that explanation so far should be enough to tell you why we're trying to do this variable complex variable pitch of the propeller because it is complex inside the airplane how that works all right now variable pitch looking at the propeller blades while you move the propeller lever this is the pitch of the blade this whole spinner is still turning very fast and you notice up here as you're turning very fast there's less resistance to the wind as you're turning very fast and that less resistance is just simply called a fine pitch. You're not taking too much of a bite. You're not taking a big, huge bite out of the air. As opposed to this one, you're taking more resistance to the wind. You're taking a bigger bite out of the air as, and that will, that will give you more torque. That'll give you more power to, certainly for the thinner air. And, and for takeoff and landing, we'll be fine and fine, but for up in the higher altitudes, we need to bite more thin air. Look at that. All right, so here's the summary. Low pitch, you're biting less air, less torque is needed, high RPM. Now, the RPMs are going to be adjusted by the governor. The, you're actually moving the pitch of the, of the blades and a governor made up of oil and a bunch of things, I'll tell you in a minute here on a page, is going to change the RPM accordingly because in cases where it needs more torque, you have to trade off something so you have lower RPM. Here you have, you know, less torque is needed, so you have high RPM. And we know this from working with standard cars, which again, it's an analogy I used to use, but it's hard to use that analogy now because not everybody knows how to drive a standard stick car. But in the lower gears, you can give it full blast on your accelerator. You're not going very fast, all right? And then you go into the higher gears, it's the same as being biting more air, and you don't need as much RPMs for that to make it work. And it saves you lots of fuel too. One of the reasons we use this is also for fuel savings, economy on fuel. You can pull this back and you can pull back your throttle and you don't, uh, you save fuel. So variable pitch, just think of the lever position is the same as the pitch of the, of the propeller. You see the levers pulled back, the pitch, the, the pitch is pulled back. The levers put straight back up, the lever straight, the pitch is straight up. I'll show that in a demo with the plate, with the blades not moving. In this plane, you can actually do that. Um, if you can have you can turn off the engine there'll be still be some residual vacuum in there and uh it might that might help with the flaps but here this is governed by the oil and you can actually do this while the engine's off 
Uh, there's still enough pressure in the oil to do this. So the governor is what really is the key. And the governor is typically, you can see this big hub up at the front where all the oil is um, sitting on the propeller a spinner itself. But the governor is a complex design of springs, flyweights, and oil. Right? These are actual flyweights right here, these U-shaped things. As they spin around, they'll open up. And I wish I could show you a video of this, but you guys, here's our, our lever here to help us with this. And the lever here will help us because the flywheel, that will help govern the speed of it just because of the flow. But don't worry about it right now. There are valves here. And what happens when you move the lever, you're changing the, the oil flow inside this device. And it'll also, it'll change the pitch of the blades, but it will also change the RPM of, of you know, the, the, you can see the engine RPM drops or, or goes back up again. So the end result, it looks like the blue lever controls the RPM. And that's what throws people off. And certainly as you adjust it, you're looking at the RPM gauge. You adjust it, you look at the RPM gauge. You you, we can't see the oil inside here. We can't, the oil pressure is the same coming through the valves. So there's no other way to measure that except to look at the RPMs. So it's like Howard talks about, you know, the variable pitch of the propeller, but really when I move the lever, it's just RPM moving. Yes, all right. Now the, the second thing that'll confuse people though, um, is that when you have the blue lever all the way full and you're gonna taxi around, you don't play with that blue lever. You only play with the throttle. And the throttle will, when you, when you move the throttle up and you get more throttle, you get more uh, power going to, you're actually feeding more fuel air mixture, you're, you're making the engine go faster and faster. You'll notice the RPM also goes up. I'm not even touching the blue lever, my RPM is going up. So while you're taxiing around and while you're at low RPMs, you just leave the blue lever full, the mixture lever full, and you just taxi around using the black throttle lever. That's all you use, it's fine. All right, it's not till you take off and get into cruise that you have to start pulling back that blue lever. All right, so that's the end of it. I just wanted to talk about the governor at the end. So that's the idea, you guys. Now you know everything about the blue lever in your, that you were afraid to ask. So, you know, and the rest of you could have just scrubbed ahead. Now, I did want to mention in here, Got Friends has done such a significant job labeling and explaining cockpit orientation. I have looked at many planes here in the sim in the last three years, and even before that with X-Plane and with FSX, and some of their manuals are pathetic. I'm not saying Got Friends. I'm saying some of the airplane manuals that I have come across to rely on to learn the airplane are pathetic. They tell us nothing except bragging about what they've done. All right? Certainly that's good. Brag about what you've done. Some of these planes take a year and a half, two years to make. Brag about what you've done, but also give us how to fly the thing. Give us some of the stuff out of the POH. I don't want all 58 pages, but I want to have something out of the POH. V speeds and cruising and normal stuff and how to handle, you know, what the plane is supposed to do. And they've done that in spades here. And they've done a really good job of it. As you can see by the cover here, we've got introduction, specifications, virtual cockpit, or meaning they're going to show us where everything is and describe it. And they've done a great job on that. So I'm not going to recreate all those pictures. Um, features, and that's their features that they've built into the plane. That's a good thing to, to read, you guys. I'm not going to go through all that here. The purpose of this is to learn to fly the thing, not to learn about all the things they did to it. That's for you to read in the manual, right? But the checklist, we certainly need. The key binds I've showed you, but they're in here. And the fact is actually very good. The frequently asked question area is really good because it answers the questions to the most asked it answers the questions that are mostly asked. And so um, people have been beta testing the, the airplane and ask some questions. And then as they release it, they hear those same questions from the rest of us. So they've addressed it right here in the manual, which is very smart of them because it saves a lot of repetition and support, right? And then the credits to all those who helped make this product happen, which is pretty cool, right? We'll do a live interactive demonstration of the, you know, the diet. We'll look around the cockpit and point things out, all right? And we also use the checklist, which highlights each thing too. We'll do that when we get to the live part. Now, I normally do a live demo partway through the lesson, but as you've seen in the YouTube videos in the past, if I were to go straight to the, straight to the um, demonstration, many people find stuff in there and then they just close it. They never get to the rest of the presentation. So I'm gonna finish the presentation, then go into the demonstration. You scrub ahead where you need to, all right, in the video. So here's the only diagram. Actually, I did a couple little ones, but this is, I'm not going through everything that they did. They've done a lot of work and do it well. 
I'm just giving you a general overview of inside the cockpit. Straight ahead of us is our normal gauges that we'll expect. Vertical speed indicator, um, right center in the middle, they have you know the turning bank indicator, our airspeed indicator. In later planes and as, as life goes on up to present day, they move the airspeed indicator up near the top uh, because it's one of the more important ones. That airspeed is so important in all phases of flight. Here we see the altimeter also. You gotta look way down here for it. The compass direction that you're headed um, the artificial horizons over here. The Hobbs meter is actually very unique. A Hobbs meter in present day, it's actually named after the person who invented it. The Hobbs meter in present day is typically just, it looks like an odometer. It's just digital numbers that turn like the original old odometers in our cars. The Hobbs meter in most planes, and including this one, is activated once the engine's running. It's, a, it's an oil pressure switch. And so Hobbs is ticking. It's like a clock and it's ticking. And it's just counting the hours you're in this plane. That helps with maintenance. Um, in present day, it helps when you're renting a plane. I mean, it's a very important thing, but I love how this is in the, in the, in the form of, a, of the face of a clock. It's actually very well done. Here's that propeller blue lever we're talking about right here, right there with your left hand, including the throttle and the mixture over here on the left also. Down here is your bomb selector and release. The big knob is for a setting that's set for both right now. It'll release both at the same time. That's That'll be quite a, a wallop. 200 pounds of bombs coming at you. And here's the release. And down below here, we can't quite see it as the window to look through where you're going to be dropping the thing. All right. The clock is right here for all kinds of things. Uh, navigation here. Here we see the manifold and RPM gauges when we're setting our engines. And over here we see temperature and pressure. I haven't labeled that. And fuel tank. This is a primer. You have to prime it till it's ready. And all your switches here. And your fuels and fuel and bombs. Now fuel and bombs, you turn all of those on and that mounts them under the wing before you start. You can't mount them under the wing after you're flying, of course. All right. Over here are some switches that I'll talk about, but these are the three switches over here that you would use. Uh, for um, unfolding the wings, which is in the up position, it's already unfolded. This is your smoke switch, and this is your um, your catapult. This is your launcher from a carrier. You click that, you got three seconds to look forward, and then it shoots you off the deck, right? That is so cool. Anyway, so use your control key and your number key for views. These are views of other planes, but you know, we do um, control one, control two, control three, control four, or you use your hat switch and you get all those different views, everybody. Now I did want to show you this picture because this is cool. I'm going to go through four pages of features and that's just a quick glance at each one. I'm not going to read you the list. They got a laundry list of who knows, 28 features, but I'm just going to show you a couple of them. In my tests with the brakes to see how touchy they were, I did a nose over. I did the nose over, it immediately bent the prop, which it should. It should stop the engine, bend the prop, and give you smoke. It did all three in spades. So that's nosing over from too much braking. To get out of that, you press Y, and then you press Y again, but it really does bend the prop. Um, starting the engine. When you start the engine, if you leave the starter on, you might get this kind of smoke for even longer until you turn it off the starter position. As you know, the first version of our Alpha Yokes you turn them to the start position and you let go. They don't spring back to both. They stay in that start position. They fix that in the next version of the Alpha Yoke, but still, that's what you get. It'll smoke, of course, to start the engine, but if you leave it in that start position, it'll keep smoking. So <laughs> I couldn't help but take the picture. <laughs> Out here you see these are fuel pods, external fuel pods, and these are external bombs. You can only have two bombs, one on each wing, back in the day. Now we're looking at the left side inside. Here's the bucket seat. Literally, because it is a bucket, it's just a metal bucket. They sit on their parachute, really, you guys. You see all that gear as they're walking to the plane. They sit on their parachute, so it is more comfortable than you might think. Uh, but you can see in here, tailwheel lock, we need it locked for takeoff and landing to keep us from doing a ground loop while we're on the ground. Here are bombs, selector, and release. This red one's the release, and this is your bomb selector. Different view, right? Features. Send up some flares. Look at this. It took me a while to catch this. It's hard to do a screen snap when the flares are flying, but I got them. And you can do this, send up these flares. And interestingly enough, on the release day, which was yesterday, 
on the release day, we did a one hour Twitch stream and we just said, let's just gather as many of these as we can because it's just came out and we're all going to buy it. And we all came into the sim and we all sat on the runway and let the flares go. That was the coolest thing. So the features like this are seen by other multiplayer users. Unfolding the wings, seen by other multiplayer users. Shooting the guns. All these features are seen by other world, as opposed to other planes that the Corsair, you fold up the wings. Another multiplayer person's looking at you and the wings aren't folded. They don't see that, right? This, they actually made it happen. They figured it out, you guys. Parking brake sets the chocks. So there was no parking brake in the real thing. You only have your toe brakes. And you don't want to keep holding those forever, so you can just use your control period, and it throws chocks under the plane, which is good. Equivalent of your brakes. All right, step number seven is take it for a spin. Get to the practice area at altitude and get comfortable with it. And this is the only way you're going to get good at your plane. Practice stalls, slow flight turns, and level flight. And this is important because here's, I'll just mention something that a lot of people have are surprised when I make that connection. The reason you practice stalls is so that you can recognize the symptoms before they happen. You don't want to stall. And a stall, by the way, a stall means a wing stall, not the engine stall. We just, you know, we just say engines, my car stalled, that meaning the engine stalled, right? In an airplane, a, a stall is really a wing stall. And what that means is you're going too slow or too high an angle of attack. And the plane just falls out of the sky, even with the engine running. You just, it's not doing lift anymore. What's going on? That's a stall. What it means is the air has stalled over the wings. If I could just show you a quick demonstration here. What have I got nearby? I've got this guy nearby. All right, we'll use this. This is the Canadian Tudor Snowbirds airplane. Um, as you're flying along, there's air going over and under the wing. This is basic aerodynamics you learn in ground school, you guys. And what this means is that that air moving over and under the wing creates lift under the wing. Now, if you just take it to a higher angle of attack, the air coming over the wing eventually gets turbulent and starts getting turbulent on the top. And that causes grief. That's starting a stall. And as you get too high an angle of attack, you lose lift completely because there's no airflow smoothly over the wing. All right? And so, and it's also more drag too, of course. Uh, the other condition is you could stay level and hold level while you cut power. And just keep trying to hold the wing, hold the wing. You will find yourself in a, in a high angle of attack. But eventually, again, you would lose lift over the wing. And that's because you're going too slow. You're, you're just going too slow to produce lift. And again, you'll either fall out of the sky or you will just mush down. All right. Typically in the power on stall, you could even be full power in a power on stall. And then you just mush out of the sky. You don't usually see an abrupt on, on a lot of plane designs. In a power off stall, you're just going too slow and you just fall off a wing and go. All right. Now, those two things. Now, you know, I'm sorry you're going back to basics, you guys, but those two things that we're talking about are important because when you're taking off, you are slow at a high angle of attack. You have a chance of a power on stall. You've got full power to take off. And if you pull up too high, that airspeed decays. You could just fall right out of the sky. And that's what happens to some people and they die. And so that's if you want to avoid that. That's why you're practicing it out in the practice area at high speed. In this picture here, you see uh, behind me here, that's me doing a power on stall and then falling right off the wing. And I fell right over backwards and I intentionally did a spiral just to see how it would feel and pulled out of that. Now, uh, a power off stall is when you're coming into land. You're coming into land and you have, you have your gear down, flaps down, everything's dirty on the plane and you're really slow and you're low and you're pulling up, you're pulling up, your speed's too much, you're pulling up and all of a sudden you just pancake right into the runway or right into before the runway. And so that's why we're learning power off and power on stall. So we can avoid them on takeoff. We can avoid them on landing. And so that's why you do it out at, out at altitude. Go up to 4,000 feet and practice these things. Now head back to the airport for your first landing and your go around practice. So what I would suggest is do a go around first. You're getting a feel for coming in at a normal approach. You'll see this in my demonstration. And as you see that it's gonna work out okay, just pull a little bit off to the side so the runway's free. Full power, positive rate, bring up your flaps. So, you know, this is something that we learn in flight school. It's something you do because ATC told you to do it or you just don't feel like the, the landing's going the way it should. It's pilot discretion, but in the control zone where the ATC has control, 
if they issue you a pull up and go around, do it. Even though you're piloting command, you argue with them, you don't do it, you could end up dead. And so, you know, there's a reason they told you to do that. They would never tell you to go around unless there's a reason for it. And it's probably because something's on the runway or an airplane hasn't left yet. Or in the case of me, I go to land and it was at an uncontrolled airport, but I go to land and a farmer pulls their tractor right out onto the runway. He doesn't want me landing near his farm. That private airstrip, I already had prior permission to land and the tractor was on the runway. I have to execute a go around. Have to. There's no way you're going to go in there and hope that you stop before you hit that per that person on the tractor. So when an ATC says pull up and go around, you comply. Then you look around once you've got it configured for the go around. You look around and just you know, what's going on. At least the runway's free. This happened to me once at Buttonville Airport coming into land, and they just said go around. I immediately pull over to the right, full power, positive rate, claps up in increments. I look over to my left and another plane had taken off. It, they took a long time. They were given an immediate and they didn't. And they were told, move now. And they did, but they were going slowly. Finally, they picked up speed and finally they took off. They came up. I'm sitting at probably 500 feet at that point, And they come right up beside me like this and go even higher. And then they take off to, to the wild blue yonder. So go arounds are something you should practice with every airplane. Sorry, this should be focused on just this airplane, but you should do go arounds also. Um, use the tail hook on your initial landing to make it easier. All right, this is important, you guys. Maybe you can't read that behind me here. Hold on. So um, the tail hook on your initial landing to make it easier, it will stop you. That's what it's for. So you come down, you still got to be able to approach properly. You got to be able to flare. And as you anywhere on the runway, it'll work. It's a beautiful thing, you guys. And it'll make you look good too, right? If anyone's watching. And then work on landing without the tail hook. I'll demonstrate both, right? Just so you can see how it works, right? And then circuits again and again. Guess what circuits do? They, they teach us the routine, the flow, as some people call it, of cleaning up the airplane on, ta on takeoff and, and dirtying it back up again, coming into land. That's what it's for. Circuits will repetitively, and do touch and goes, repetitively get you in the know of, okay, tail wheels locked, flaps are down, all the things you have to do, you know, downwind checks and temperature pressures and the green switches are set and circuit breakers, are, all that stuff is going to have you do in a circuit. Circuits are the best thing for getting to know your airplane very well. Absolutely. All right, here's the demonstration. Now, I'm going to put this at the end of this. On a YouTube video, I'll put it at the end. If it's a classroom with a bunch of us, I can do it now and they're still there in the classroom. Here in videos, I found if you put the demo in the middle, people just kind of go away after that. Hey, cool, let's try it. And the way they go, and they never see the finish. They never see links. They never see any way that I would recommend to finish up. So I'm going to jump over and just do the last couple of things we want to talk about. And then we'll go straight to demonstration, you guys. So in the demonstration, just like you would do in your ticket for a spin idea, you grab your checklist POH in hand and we head to the airplane. We do the walk around, the run up, and then review the takeoff checklist. Now, I didn't actually do a ground check on this one. I did it ahead of time and then I cut the video. So I ended up cutting it out of the demonstration. Um, the run up is very simple on these airplanes. We're just putting it up to 1200 RPM. We're checking left and right magnetos and making sure the RPMs don't drop. You know, your basic run up is all it's done. In the demonstration, I'll take off with a carrier launch, although I'll start at midway on one of the runways first, and then I'll go over and land on the on the carrier and take off from the carrier. Stalls and turns, you guys, and get used to it. Do a full stop landing with a tail hook and a wheel look wheel. Hold on. This is something you test yourself with on a Friday afternoon after happy hour. Do a full stop landing with a tail hook and a tail wheel lock. Now say that five times in a row. All right, practice landings without a tail hook, but ensure the tail wheel lock. As you're landing, you'll see in the demonstration, as you're landing, keep that stick all the way back. You gotta keep that tail wheel on the ground once it's there. All right, and just like on a carrier, we're doing a three-point landing. Whereas some tail wheel planes, we wanna do main wheels first, let the tail settle eventually. All right, but not in this case. This is three-point landing because you're trying to catch the rester wire. So you do a three-point landing all the time everywhere else too. Practice using guns and bombs for a test of your accuracy. Find anything, because it doesn't hurt anything at all, right? Find anything, shoot it. Go at this water tower on Midway, all right? And just don't hit it with your plane. <laughs> a lot of things are hard-coded now. They're not They're not something you can fly through. A lot of buildings, a lot of fences, they're hard-coded. You, you hit those, you know it. 
So a big thank you to Jonks of Got Friends. He's the one who's my contact, who is um, one of the the design, one of the programmers that are working with it. I think he's in texture design also. He does a lot of this stuff. Uh, certainly a principal uh, out of all of this. Funny in this diagram, I don't see my other two propellers. What's with that? I just realized it now. Oh, because they're spinning, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, this looks like a propeller, but it's not. This is spinning. You can see a hint of it right here. So the engine's still running on this one. I'm just surprised you couldn't actually see anything. This angle, the sun isn't hitting it r properly, so you see the propeller, but it is there. Excellent product, excellent support, and uh, they certainly um, made sure that we had this ahead of time so we could do this. If you have any questions, you guys, you can certainly ask them every, anywhere. There's many places to get a hold of me. Notifications of Twitch and YouTube would be up here on the Twitter, formerly, uh, sorry, X, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> the problem I have with this, you guys, is we say the verb tweet. I'm going to tweet is the actual verb we use to actually send out a, a message, right? Now with X, what do we do? We send out an X? I don't know. I, I, I'm still not used to that, but you get the idea of what that is. Um, you can subscribe to help support the stream and make sure things like this happen. I hope you subscribe here in YouTube and do a follow. And uh, let's see if we, I, I've just started out just doing these things in the past little while. I mean, I think three years ago, I did a couple of videos for my students, my online students on Udemy and Skillshare. And that's all I used it for. But more and more people are turning here to YouTube to find more stuff from me. So I'm building up the, the student base, user base here. So by all means, if this interests you and you want more of this, then uh, make some comments, do a follow, and uh, it would be much appreciated if you'd subscribe. But that, my friends, is the very famous aircraft that helped turn the tides of war. We'll be flying out of Papa Mike Delta Yankee PMDY at Midway. If you've got the scenery installed, you'll also notice we also have the USS Lexington installed. This is from Orbix, which isn't far away from there, which was a, an aircraft carrier that was stationed at Midway. And we'll fly from here and we'll fly over to the aircraft carrier and fly back again and do some things. Let's go. For this first part, I just want to demonstrate the wings and then we'll get into the checklists themselves. And we'll do a walk around too. So the wings are folded by default. The way to fold them is with this switch right here. If you're, if you're folding them back up again afterwards, make sure your flaps are up. They won't fold with the flaps down. Makes sense. Wings folded, I click it. You can see them start to move already from the outside view. You can see them unfolding right there. Chunks are on, which means the parking brake is on. For those who haven't used the parking brake, it's control, period. That'll get you your parking brake. And when we do a walk around of an airplane, we're checking to make sure everything's in place. We're looking at hinges, we're looking at dents and loose screws, believe it or not. If there's any screws poking out that are rattling away. Checking the underneath here, I mean, there's lots of things that we will check. What I'd like to do is just slow down my camera so that I can have a really good look without going too fast. How about a number two here? There we go. And um, so what we do is uh, typically you start by going into the cockpit and you hit the, um, you, you hit the flap switch. Now the flaps are over here on the left right around there there we go landing flaps and uh in this plane um it's a crank everything's a crank and if you take a look over here also i mean i'm on a drone camera right now so we'll just uh show you where things are um everything's a crank when you look down here landing gear is a crank right there and we're just looking around the cockpit at, at different things before we get going here here is the uh, cowl flaps and they're a crank too when you look over on this side, you notice that there's also all your trims are here. There's your rudder trim, your aileron tab, 
and you look back here and you can see that we have the elevator tra tr trim. So these ones, I mean, typically the rudder trim and the aileron trim, you can do those manually with a mouse. But the elevator trim, you can use your elevator trim in your home cockpit and that'll work just fine. Looking around the cockpit while we're here, might as well look at this baby here. We can see this is for the bomb selector, this big black lever. And the red one is to actually release the bomb. And here is a view out the bottom of the airplane. There's one of those views on both sides. Down that way, there we go. All right, so we want to drop the flaps. So the best thing to do is, we'll come back out of our drone camera. The best thing to do is to use our flaps switch. We'll just go like this. And we'll hit our best master battery on and reduce the flaps. Now they won't reduce if the engine hasn't been running. So it won't reduce, there's not enough vacuum. These are vacuum driven flaps. So you gotta have the engine running or after it's stopped, there's still enough vacuum pressure to do that at least once. All right, so that's something you can't do in here because you have to have the engine running first. So a lot of times they'll leave the flaps down after the last engine run so that when they do the walk around, they'll actually see the flaps. You wanna look at the hinges and you wanna look and make sure everything's done correctly on them. It's something we check. I know it's a, it's a foolish check in the sim because, um, here we just reset this view because uh, it, they're always gonna be fine. We're not gonna have any loose hinges, but it's just a check that we do. When, uh, so once you get in, turn the power on and, and make sure of the battery and the rest, let's just walk around the plane. Now typically you just get out and you're just gonna have a look. And you're looking to see that that screw there is closing that little, that little compartment. And, th and that's really what you're looking for when you look at a plane is you look at to make sure there's nothing loose and no compartment doors are open and then you can get back in the plane because once you're in the air of course you can't look at anything. So you just look around and make sure that things are in order. Now when you look at this you're looking at cables like this. All the supporting cables and control cables. You're looking at those to make sure they're not frayed. All this boring stuff but we do it every single flight. You're looking at the leading edge of that horizontal stabilizer. You're looking at any lights that you're going to find you look at these hinges of the elevator and make sure that they're fine too the bolts are in place they're not all rusted the trim tab um, hinges are fine the rudder hinges are fine you're looking inside these little crevices at the rudder hinges and making sure they're okay you're looking at the rudder trim tab which is right here this compartment has a little latch. You're going to make sure that that, you know, it's to be able to look at the linkage. You're going to make sure that that latch is closed. You never know what got rattled loose. You never know what what could be loose. And you're always doing a physical check. Obviously in a scramble, let's say there's bombers coming in or something's going on here at Midway, you would just run to the plane. But they would already, the mechanics would have already done all those checks so that your plane is ready, or as they say, battle ready. And back here is the tail hook. That's where it is, and that's where it'll be dispatched from when we release it. Down here is a castering tail wheel. This is not a steerable, but you want that to be loose while you're taxiing. And as you use your rudder pedals, you're typically going to use differential braking. You're going to use your left toe brake to brake this wheel, which will make you turn left, and you'll use your right toe brake to brake this wheel, which will make you turn right. And it just pivots around the wheel. And the castering wheel lets you do that easily. You can see the position it's in. Now, um, when you're taking off, you want to lock that. You want to lock it straight back. And same with when you're landing, you could end up with a ground loop if that thing's left castering like that. So we'll have a look at that when we get flying. Bear with me, we'll just go through the rest of the walk around. You're gonna check lights too to make sure that they're working. Yeah, there's the end of the tail hook. You can see the, just the end of it right there. Now you could, uh, if you wish, it's not a normal check, but you could extend the tail hook. I don't see it in the checklist, but I'm sure they do. They extend the tail hook, make sure it actually works. And so you turn power on again, go back in without the drone camera. And with your, with your power on now, see if we can get around and look at that hook. Uh, we'll do it from here and then we'll just go into drone camera again and uh, and the tail hook inside the plane 
I use my head tracker for this part, the tail hook be inside the plane. If you look over here, this lever right here, you just hover over it and it shows you, and you just extend the tail hook out the back. And that's a good way to remember it. It's out the back, it's now pushed back into the plane, out the back, into the plane. All right, and so that should be working. Let's go back out, and there's our tail hook. And you can see it there sitting ready to catch a wire. I'm recommending you use this on your first landing, not in your takeoff. It can drag you around. It can give you a ground loop. It's not good to have it here. It is a spring-loaded hook. All right, but you're checking to make sure that that's okay. And it certainly is. We'll come back in the cockpit and we'll, and we'll bring it back. There we go. And so now while you're doing the walk around, you're checking the lights, you're checking the hinges again on this side of everything. Any access holes, you're making sure that any latches are closed and the screws are in place. You're looking for any linkages that are broken. You really are inspecting things that can move, any kind of screws, any kind of supporting or controlling wires, and you're making sure they all work. And it's really what you're doing when you're looking at a plane. And then now we just go around here looking at the the flap edge over here we'll be looking at the aileron edge making sure that those are all working here's your aileron part right here and there's your aileron trim tab right there and again looking right in you, you literally look right in there and check the hinges and make sure that rivets and hinges are fine you're also coming over here looking at nav lights and then you're coming underneath here you're checking that your ordinance is in order and that it's securely attached and you notice here there's your release there's the actual release hook there and at the back they've modeled it very well and uh, that'll release the bomb and just before they take off they'll make sure it's live these are the drop tanks these contain fuel and you'll look at your fuel con your fuel configuration you'll see how much they can hold and uh, if I remember, I think they're 27 gallons each. And your main fuel tank's 58, but we'll go and check that. You're checking to make sure all those linkages are good. They can be dropped also. There is a switch to jettison them. And you would typically do that uh, just before you land. So you want to use up these guys first. Because you're going to jettison before you land. And I guess the reason for that is... Um, because it's a danger. If you did a wing over or if your gear collapsed, your fuel is not going to blow up on your plane. Um, I'm just guessing, you guys. I'm not sure about that, of course. I'm just taking a guess. Um, underneath the plane, you're looking again for linkages and any, any areas that you can drain fuel and check the fuel. Um, they don't have that feature here, of course. These are the viewable areas, the windows at the bottom. If you look up, you can see inside the cockpit. And there's one on either side, and that's for v for bomb viewing. There's our chocks when you put your par parking brake on. Then you're just checking all the hydraulics, make sure there's no leaks on the hydraulics. You're checking the linkage in here, which they've done very well in this plane. And that's your landing gear linkage on both sides that make that all happen. Pretty cool. In this plane, you can look in side in both areas you can look inside the engine now typically out here in the engine what you're looking for is you're checking the leading edge of each propeller you actually run your finger along that leading edge the the blunt side all right that leading edge you're making sure there's no cracks and dents and whatever which could lead to metal fatigue you're making sure those are fine now a really nice feature of this plane and i'll do this from without the drone camera a really nice feature is two of them one of them is that you can check the pitch of the propeller right now it's set for full fine high rpm which is takeoff and landing position not much of an angle on that propeller right and if we go inside i'll show you this first feature and then i'll show you the others if we go back Back inside go to external view and get that same sort of view from here if I can pick it up from here well that'll be close enough and then even now without the engine on just move your propeller lever I'm pulling it all the way back I'm pushing it all the way forward and you notice that it's a bigger bite and we'll talk about that in we've talked about that in the presentation of the propeller lever and it's nice that they let us do that there must still be oil in the governor that lets us release it and expand it but typically you wouldn't see that animation until it's actually running all right and that's a nice feature to be able to see what's really going on there while that whole thing rotates pretty amazing all right back in inside and 
one of the things you can do is look inside the air, the engine and this is pretty cool now this is a, a twin wasp so what that means is the front seven cylinders and the back seven cylinders are offset so that the air can get at both there's the back ones back there each cylinder has two spark plugs these valves that you see here are intake and output valves and then you also will see spark plug wires that will connect to it and so uh, air cooled for sure nice radial engine this is used in the dc3 it's actually used in a whole lot of airplanes back in those days the dc3 has two of these the 1830 uh, twin wasp from Pratt and Whitney and so uh, that's nice that they actually model that imagine the amount of work to make all of that happen that's pretty cool um, and then of course when everything's running you can get this close too which you wouldn't in real life but you can get right in here and see well you won't see pistons moving but you'll certainly see the propeller moving and this will be you know this hub here is where the oil is for the governor and all the rest of it and that'll help with uh, moving these propellers to the proper pitch uh, great attention to detail there's no doubt about that I'll show you the back compartment in a minute, but for now we'll just come down and finish our walk around. We look again at this wheel, we're looking for wear and tear in the wheel. We're looking for the brakes themselves, the viewing windows to look at the brakes, make sure that there's still lots of brake lining to go there. And you're looking at linkages and make sure everything's fine. Checking again the security of the fuel pod on this side, you're also looking to security of the bomb and making sure that it's in place. I've actually seen them grab the bomb and shake it because you know once you get rolling there's a lot of shaking going on on this plane and you don't want these things dropping before you take off. Um, and you notice in here these are where the guns are, these little inlets here. And uh, there's your landing light, landing light. And one of these is your taxi light and the others are your guns. We just have a look here right there those look like guns your taxi lights up here too so let me see if i can just turn that on i've got power on already taxi light on looks like it might have activated that one that's really your landing light no that is your taxi light i'm sorry you guys that's your taxi light your landing lights actually under here right here it won't work while I'm in drone. That thing, it'll illuminate straight down if you turn it on, but it'll swing out and face the front. That's a very blinding light right there underneath the wing. That's your landing light. And this is your taxi light right here. And then those things aren't working while I'm in drone. All right, so we've got the idea. We've checked everything. We've checked fuel. We've done everything. And we now go back inside. But I want to just go inside here for a second and just show you some attention to detail. Inside this compartment, they've got great attention to labels and detail. Unbelievable. Obviously, the hatches on the outside will get you inside to look around and see things. Um, and that's what we're doing right now. All the boxes you see here, you know, obviously, they have to get in here to service them. And, uh, and all these cables that you see here are the control cables going back to the uh, elevator and the rudder. And you'll notice if I can do this with... Hold on, I'll press C on my keyboard and I might be able to... There we go. So I'm moving my stick back, then forth, and then I'm moving it left and then right. Now left right is your aileron, so you don't see the aileron moving, you're just seeing residual movement there from my stick. But if you use your rudders, your rudder pedals, you'll notice that's your other two, and that's pretty awesome how they've done that animation. And uh, you can see that's, you know, like the real thing, that's what it would be, nice thick steel, stainless steel cables that allow us to uh, see that in action. There we go. And then now I've pressed C again to release it. Anyway, I just had to go in there and just have a look because it's unbelievable the amount of work that they've done. And I guess we could, you know, I never thought of it, but I guess we could actually go look at the pitch again really close and then press the C button again. Come down here like this, maybe. And press the C keyboard, key, key press, and then now use your, your lever. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, I should have done that the first time. And we can see I'm just using my lever forward and back. And that amount of pitch makes a big difference, you guys, and depends on your altitude and depends on what you're going to do. Anyway, I forgot about the, the C key to be able to look at things moving while you're actually using the drone camera. So that's the walk around, you guys. You're checking that everything's fine. Um, 
the next thing you want to do is cockpit orientation. We've done some of that, and it's certainly in the manual, and huge in the manual. So we'll actually show you these things when we when we hit them. Uh, when we need to hit them. The main part here, you can see all of the the switches that are here. I did a, a, a brief picture of all of this, but um, the, the manual goes right into great detail of all of them. All right, and you can see in here, we've got uh, my power switches are on from my alpha. Turn those two off again without the C key. There we go. Uh, so let's just do something here. From my alpha, I'm hitting battery. I'm hitting generator or alt, which is alternator in, in modern GA planes. Gun camera is right here. Gun camera, which you can turn on. And we'll go take a look at that. That's on the outside. It's another view. It's a beautiful view. Uh, tail running light. We can see that down here. Flash off and on formation lights. Those things we won't do in this demo, but you can see in here the normal lights that we see here. If we were to press our landing light, that would be that bright the bright one on the outside. Maybe we'll go out and have a look at how bright that is. We'll use, we'll see it when, when the engine's running. And then uh, um, taxi light is there. Beacon light. Now the beacon light is actually for flares. So the beacon light is actually over here. If we take a look at these switches right here. You can see them labeled already. Wing, smoke, and launch. So this is the wing. I didn't actually... I unfold the wings before I did the inspection, but you could have left them in the up position, but they're unfolded now in the up position. Smoke and then launch. This is our catapult launch, so don't touch that button until you're ready to take off. <laughs> um, we won't be uh, demonstrating comm radios or the transponder. We'll leave the transponder in 7000 European VFR. And then... Um, and then we'll just have a look over here now. This is interesting because now your payload, you notice they're all on. And this is your, come back a little bit here. This is your out, your right bomb on the outside and your left bomb on, the, sorry, the far wing on the right, the far wing on the left, bombs. In the middle is your drop tanks, your extra fuel. And you can drop those too. And interestingly enough, when you drop those, you see a trail of fuel. Andrew had discovered that. A trail of fuel as you're dropping your drop tanks that have fuel in them. <laughs> so that's why you're seeing them on the outside, because we have all these switches on, you guys. All right. There's our primer. And this is an important gauge once you get rolling. The first thing you want to do once you're running is to make sure you have temperature and pressures and you want you'll see that uh, in in the poh if you guys want to read the poh you'll see that you need to warm this up to at least 40 before you take off and they recommend at first um, uh, uh, 700 rpm then as it warms up you get it take it to a thousand rpm and then eventually you do your ground test obviously they would pre-warm their planes if they were battle ready if they were ready to jump in and go they would have someone uh, already have warmed them up and have them ready to go your fuel pressures you'll see them come up you'll see fuel pressure come up into the 15 range the oil come up into the 100 range and you'll check those on downwind you'll check those periodically and uh, anyway well let's get started we're going to get started and get this thing rolling now the best thing to do you guys when you're back in here i'm going to go back into normal mode like this without my drone camera so I can clickable everything's clickable from here my normal view and I'm going to use my head tracker for this and I'm just going to center it there we go and the head tracker is a little bit jittery I could probably tone that down a bit but it lets me look all the way around the plane as you would need to if you have somebody on your six and it's also handy when you're in formation flying to be able to look around especially if you go ahead of the formation you can look back and see where they are but uh, that's handy. Yeah, I'm using the Toby eye tracker for this. I'm not using much of the eye tracker part. It's mainly my head. All right, so what you want to do is pull up the checklist. Let me just hold on with my uh, head tracker for the moment while I look around at other screens. I'm going to use this checklist, even though it's more elaborate in the manual and certainly way more elaborate in the real POH. Uh, Pre-flight checks, you're, you're just making sure the wings are unfolded. Check. And what I like about the in-game the in checklist is when you click on these things, 
then it shows you where it is and it illuminates it. That's such a nice feature here in the sim and it teaches you things without having me show you stuff, without having anybody walk you through all this stuff. And that's a really handy thing. But you got to take your time though when you're doing this sort of thing. Left drop tank. So what they're doing, as soon as they get in the plane, before starting the engine, they're making sure switches and all things are set. You notice that? So really when you're looking around, you're just making sure that uh, each of these things are set. So left drop tank, we click on that. You can see it's right there. As I mentioned, there's your drop tanks. And if you come down here also to your bombs, you can click that and make sure that your bombs are set. The equivalent is someone coming out to the wing and attaching them and then you've got your bomb set or you bringing it out to the wing and attaching them and if you take that off it takes the bomb off without any explosion now be careful about setting off your bombs I'm going to just come over here for a second, um, probably this view. Let's just use our hat switch. Hat switch one back, one more back, and then now we'll go. I'm using the right hat switch each time. Now right down here, as you've seen in the presentation, this is your bomb select. Right now I'm set for both. Both, all right? And this is your release. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen, right? When we release the bombs. All right, now I have it mapped to my to the stick. I can release the bombs on the stick. So let me just give you a demonstration. You would never do this in real life, but it lets you see the effect of the bombs. Let me center this back to here. Let's do it from here and we'll see what the bombs look like. You're ready for it. I'm gonna release the bombs, watch the effect. That's quite the effect. I think the plane would be gone by now. But you know, and you see the bombs are now missing off the, off the wings. So now we just simply go back to here, reset, come back to here, two, over to here. I'm just using my hat switch this time. And you can see that you'll have to just take it off and back on and that'll rearm your bomb. All right, simple as that. You can only do these things while you're on the ground. You can't just be up in the air and keep rearming your bombs. That wouldn't be very realistic, would it? All right, if we look outside the plane, we see we now have bombs hanging off the wing. Not a very good picture of it, but you can see it like that. There's our bombs hanging off the wing. All right, let's get rolling. Uh, let's get this thing rolling. So this just gives you an orientation, and I hope that's okay. You can scrub ahead, certainly, if anything gets boring here, but you should be doing checklists at least once to get a feel for what it was really like in all these planes that we work with. All right, now the weight and balance, I showed you that diagram earlier, the weight and balance verified. The map tray, now that's an interesting point here, and you don't really discover it until you actually do this checklist. And you can see it's right here. And this is very handy for a number of reasons. First of all, these checklists that you can see. All right, and you can see in here whether you want authentic ground handling or not. The aerobatic smoke, which you can still turn on with a switch over there. Um, handle interactions. Now, right now, when you raise gear or click on, right now, if I click on cow flaps, it'll just start turning. And away it goes. Look, I'm not doing anything. I'm not using my mouse or whatever. So that's handy because if you sat here looking at it with your mouse, you could end up crashing the plane. You should be having your head out the plane. And pilots would typically look out the plane window and then use a hand crank while they're not even looking at it, right? So that's why they made this automatic. R really brilliant what Got Friends have done with that. And uh, same with your flaps. When you use your flap switch inside your home cockpit, you'll see the lever go flying around over there on the left. All right, so on here, uh, if you want to manually move the handles each turn with your mouse wheel, you can certainly turn that feature on. Get a better view here of it. There it is, okay. Refill the drop tanks requires the tank insulation. So you, your tanks should already be on, and of course you can't put those things on until you're on the ground. But leave your tanks on, and then you can refill them. That's cool. Uh, primer simulation, when you do the primer over here, we'll do that right now. Hold it, hold it. It's under primed. Listen to the sound too. Let me just turn that up a bit. You do that until it says that it's that it's ready. And it still says ready. There we go. And uh, this is the first time cold and dark, so that's why. Uh, primer simulation. 
unfold the wings we already did so it gives you a handy checklist here in case you didn't know where the switches were to do all that the rest of this in here is just for show but it certainly looks great I wish it did more uh, certainly you can't just use the, the, the e6b a protractor sitting here over top of a diagram but you know maybe throw a VNC in here but you know it would have to change there's so much would have to happen here if they want to make this more interactive and uh, and it might it, you know it might cause a, a delay in the release of the product too so <laughs> we're just glad we have it that's the tray normally they put their maps and whatever and there is a clip for it there's also a clip in real life there's a clip that holds it in place a little flip down clip or something like that because when you take off you don't want this thing uh, sliding at you now it might just be the way that it locks in when you push it in all right you pull it up and in and it probably locks that way but in real life i remember reading the poh it just said there's a clip to keep it from sliding out in the middle of a takeoff can you imagine that would probably hurt uh, so you know all of the trim handles set to neutral now if you come in cold and dark they are already set to neutral all right and you can see in here battery voltage checked master on let's just make sure we're doing things in order i'm going to turn my battery on and you'll notice that uh, it's right there and there's a there's a meter on the side let's see if we can get a view of that again i'm going to go standard view push back on my hat switch right 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 all these views are just doing right with my hat switch all right let me just bring this over here and you can see that when i've turned on my master i've turned on my master i expected this to show some difference in uh and it's probably because it's set for yep, so, yep let's just see if we can turn change that there we go and that says volts okay so now turn my uh, master switch on and you should see voltage nope no voltage okay then it's still on amps again volts here we go that's on volts okay off it's not moving okay well, with shows we got good voltage, whether the switch is on or not. Probably connected straight to the battery. Okay, uh, so a battery voltage is checked, and if you click on it, it does show that selector switch. All right, all your trim handles are over here. There's one trim, there's the other trim, and there's the other trim all set. And they are set for neutral by, by default in the middle. Now, you will notice you'll have to give it right rudder like any powerful airplane. Uh, as you're taking off single engine, uh, you'll have some pull to the left and you'll have to manage that before you take off as you take off as you're flying i've noticed you do have to set some some uh, aileron trim which is what you're looking at right now and uh, that aileron trim just helped from the plane just kept going left um, the wings dipped left uh, as i was flying and so i just had to do a little trim there depends on the torque it depends on your settings depends on your altitude at the time and what settings you have for your propeller and your throttle all right, so now we know where that is. Let's go faster through the checklist. The idea isn't to win any kind of awards for going fast. Um, but the idea is to uh, get to know your airplane. So now we want to unlock the tail wheel because we're going to taxi first. So here it is unlocked. There it is locked. If you if you hover over it, it says locked. And this, there's also a label there too. All right, so we want to make sure it's unlocked. The altimeter is calibrated. Let's go there. And the altimeter, when you see that over, again, I have to move this around just to see these things, but here's your altimeter here. Calibrated, The uh, we're at Midway Island. We're about uh, maybe uh, 20 feet above sea level. <laughs> and I think it's looking good, but there is, a, uh, there is the altimeter calibration here. And obviously you would set it to you set it to your current altimeter setting. Here it is on standard 299 or 2, and uh, you would just turn that accordingly, and obviously your altitude would change. A nice thing that you can do if you don't know the altimeter setting is either use 299 or 2, or if you know the elevation of the airport, easy enough to look up in Little Lab Map or Sky Vector, um, and then just set your, el set your el altitude here, and you should see the altimeter setting there it's good when you're at a known airport with a known elevation all right that's your altimeter before starting the engine all right fuel selector main let's go look at that over here it's set for main right now fuel selectors on right fuel selectors on main there we go and uh main selected emergency fuel pump switch all right the emergency fuel pump switch and it's right here and you can just turn that on 
and you know emergency fuel pump or just call it fuel pump you guys a lot of planes you turn on your fuel pump first once you're rolling the engine has its own fuel pump and then you're fine uh, emergency fuel pump is on magnetos on both all right now when you look at the magnetos here just use your mouse but my alpha magnetos are fighting it all right so i'm going to turn my alpha magnetos on both all right it has two spark plugs for each cylinder that's what left and right means left spark plugs right spark plugs and we'll walk through that at our at our startup all right we're good i know this is slow but at first you, you've got to get used to where everything is that's on now magnetos are on and uh throttle lever increase above 10 percent all right so now we go and look at this there's the throttle lever all the way back all the way forward all the way back 10 percent roughly and then you'll adjust your throttle as you get going second thing on there you'll see it says mixture right here and the mixture we're going to go full forward always when we first first start full rich and it's labeled right on here down the bottom here rich and lean all right and then now we go to propeller lever 100 percent meaning all the way in right here propeller lever all the way out propeller lever all the way in so um, those are the settings for takeoff and landing. Propeller lever in, mixture in. All right, full, like right to the firewall. And then adjust your throttle as you go along. Primer pump to ready, we did that. Cowling flaps as required. Let's have a look outside the plane just for a second. We've got them open for now. We're on the ground. We want to keep it warm because there's, there's uh, we want to keep it uh, at the right temperature so you might want to leave them open as you go along the ground with them closed there's not enough air getting through you're not moving fast even though there's a propeller out front and so you could overheat the engine so i'm going to leave them open that was this crank right here cowl flaps it just lets hot air get out right that's really what's happening right now when it's open uh, section light as required and you could click on that just to see what that means section light over here just click it on or off and you you'll see what that means now there's a bunch of dimmers everywhere too for lights all around and so now we've got all the way down here approach lights on um, i'm not going to turn the approach lights on the landing light until uh, approach lights formation lights are just smaller lights but they didn't have leds back then i'm not going to turn those on until the engine's actually running all right starter switch hold until engine start generator switch on so right now we've only got master switch on but not generator switch yet until the engine's running let's get back to normal position we have chocks on the area is clear we looked outside and there's nobody behind us because we're going to raise some smoke and we're going to have quite a bit of thrust thrown back quite a bit of uh, air wash and so what we'll do is we'll start the engine and if we look over here there's your starter down here but what we'll do is i'm just going to use the starter inside Prop clear. Should turn that down a little. We still hear it. You still hear me talk. So, and then we check right away that we've got some temperature starting to rise let's do a little bit of a check like this see it out the corner there is there any better view probably not all right let's just do it this way we'll just use our cursor keys and we're looking at temperature right here let me keep it down to Right now it's sitting at uh, 200, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. So if you take a look at this RPM, it's really just using the throttle for now until we get up higher and then you can adjust the RPM blue lever. But So there would be a thousand RPM and they're saying keep it around 700. If you looked at the real POH, keep it around 700 until you get up around 40 degrees. We can see in here it's up around 20 30 there's 40 there so we'll just let it warm up pressures are in the green also sorry it's jumping around here Let's see if i can do that it's great for when you're flying but not good when you're trying to focus on an instrument like this all right let's do it that way it's steadier 
All right, and you can see in here we've got pressure on both fuel and oil, and we've got temperature rising toward 40. As soon as it's past 40, we can do our ground checks. All right, generator switch is on. All right, and then now we'll go to before taxi. All right, headphones as required, pedo heat as required. We don't need it here, we're at midway. And uh, propeller lever as required, parking brakes, chocks removed before we start taxiing. All right, and then we're gonna go into a takeoff. All right, so just so you can see in here, prior to takeoff, landing light on. I'm gonna just leave the parking brake on for now and I don't have to hold the tow brakes. So the landing light, you can see the switches down here. I'm just gonna use my landing light Do it this way. And I want you to see the whole thing, and I'm, oh, it's already on. We can see that. Look how bright that is. Wow. And uh, pretty blinding. And when you turn it off, you see it fold back up into the wing like that. Put it back on, out it comes. In, the, in some of the other planes, it still illuminates while it's pointing down to the pavement in case you needed that illumination around the plane while you're loading and stuff. And then you can flip it down to the point out front. This one just goes down right away out front. Landing lights on, propeller lever pushed to 100%. Canopy position, and we're gonna close it. We're finished taxing, actually we're sitting at the end of the runway, so here we're past 40 now. I'm gonna take it up to, again, I'm just gonna use my throttle for this for now. I'm gonna take it up to RPM of 1,000, so that'll be right there. I'm still leaving my blue lever all the way forward. And this is the part that confuses a lot of people. You leave it forward for taxiing, you leave it forward for taking off. Uh, we only pull it back when we're during cruise, and especially when we get into the higher altitudes, we need to take a bigger bite of the air. So a lot of people here, the RPM should be moved after you warm up and they start playing with the uh, blue lever and it doesn't affect them, it doesn't take them any higher. So we're just using our normal throttle lever and we're not looking at manifold pressure, we're looking at RPM now. All right, now that it's up around close to 50, climbing to 50, we can do our ground checks, which would be up around 1100, or sorry, around 1200 for this plane. And the ground checks, you're just checking the magnetos is what you're doing. Canopy position as required. Now before takeoff, this is what this is prior to takeoff, we wanna make sure the canopy's closed. So we'll just move it like this. There's your canopy lever, and you can see that the canopy's open right now. So the canopy lever, I'm just using my mouse. It's actually easier than using my head tracker right now. And we just use your, just focus on it and use your mouse wheel. All right, and it's got a few different stops on along the way. Should have zoomed out a little further maybe. And uh, you can leave it there for taxiing sort of thing, and then you can just close it completely and latch it. And there it is completely closed. Here's your pedo switch. Oops, there's your pedo switch. If I can get to it, there we go. If you want some pedo heat on or off. Strange that they actually have left or right because in, in the left side of the cockpit, there's some switches that go left to go on. But uh, anyway, we don't need that here for the moment anyway. We'll close that up, we're good. And if, it's, if you wonder if it's closed all the way, click it once more and it'll probably open like that. So let's click it again to get it closed. There we go. All right, good enough. Canopy position, tailwheel locked. Where's that? Let's come back here. Well, we can actually do it right here. Click, it'll take us there. And it's in the locked, unlocked position, so we want to lock it. There we go, because we're about to take off. Leave it unlocked for taxiing. This I'm actually going to set to one of the bombs too. I'm going to put it on the left bomb. There we go. And by the way, the guns themselves, to reload them, once you've expelled them, which is a real, it was a real pain for the pilots back in the day because with with uh, extra guns now in this model of the Wildcat, they would they would go run out of guns quickly. But we've got this charge the right gun, hold it, and then charge the left gun right beside the seat if you run out of guns, and that's handy. We can do that. We don't have to land and get them to reload it. But the bombs, once you use them and the drop tanks are dropped then you have to come back here on the ground and turn them off and turn them back on again. Just so you know how that works. All right. Throttle lever increased to 100% to take off. Yep, okay, and then we go into cruising. All right, and then it's really just landing gear raised, emergency fuel pump switch off, landing light off. All right, and then we just, as required everything after that, all right? 
So let's just minimize that. We'll bring it back in when we come in for a landing. We'll make sure that works. We're not quite lined up. I'm going to have to just do something here with the tail wheel. Unlock it. And as you can see from here, that's not quite lined up. And so I'm going to give it a little bit more power. And I'm going to have to take off. There we go. Take off the parking brake, which is the chocks. A little bit of power to get turned, and we're pretty much down the runway. That'll work. Now I'm going to do I'm going to do a, a catapult. It's just to take off, just so you can see what that's like. Be careful with your brakes, by the way. You saw the picture of what happens if you put your brakes on too abruptly. You'll bend the prop and cause some smoke. All right, let's get this back up to around a thousand. We're ready to roll. Now here's what we're going to do. Fuel pump is on. Back locked again. Make sure we're locked for takeoff. And we're going to flip this switch right here. Not yet, because the minute you do it, it's a three second countdown. I'm, gonna, I'm recommending this for beginners because it'll just get you off the deck real quick. Whether you're on a runway or wherever you are. Later on we can do a carrier landing. It's not far from here. All right, so, th and that's what we'll do. Actually, we'll take off and head over to the carrier and go in for a landing on there, on the Lexington. So, you know, here what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll hit the switch get our view back to there so you might hopefully you got a switch for that whatever view you want to use and uh, and it'll accelerate very quickly um, as it accelerates quickly you might need a bit of right rudder so just giving you a heads up on what's going to happen here all right let's go back around flip the switch and hit the throttle flip the switch full throttle the way it goes look at that I got a little bit of right rudder in already and we're off and running doesn't get any easier than that. All right, gear up. Got a bit of wind here. Here's coming up. And we turn off the fuel pump. We're good. And we can turn off the landing light. That's good. Landing light is no. Oops. Wow, look at that. My my hat switch is getting very finicky. Landing light is off. Looks like my taxi light's still on. It's off now. And we're rocking and rolling. Giving you an idea where we are, you guys, just to give you an idea. Here, we'll go back to this now. Now the head tracker helps. There's a lot to see here. This is actually a flightsim.to file. I think I've mentioned it at the start of the presentation. And we're, this is handy to have because it's the era. Uh, Midway was primarily where the, the F4F-4 was used. Uh, Pearl Harbor, there were some of them there, but uh, there were mostly F4F-3s. Uh, actually, here we see a bunch of Catalinas in the water, too. Oh, yeah. Cool. And we just took off from back here. Back here, here's the actual seaplane base, as they call it, or air base. I'm going to pull back some power now. I'm going to take it back to 29 on my manifold. And we'll just do a bit of sightseeing first, and we'll show you what we should set. And there's where we took off, and underneath here you'll see... Underneath here you'll see all the planes on the tarmac. There's where we took off right there. All right. Let's head over this way. So now, um, in normal flying now, we've got it set for cruise, which is 29 on the manifold pressure gauge. So I'm using my throttle, my black throttle, to move that to 29. And then now my RPMs, I want to get those around 2200, if you'll remember, or 21, somewhere around there. So I'm pulling back my blue lever to 22. A big, there's a number two there, and there's two there on the needle. This is normal cruising, and this will preserve some fuel, of course. You're not going to get the maximum speed, but we are getting 160 knots at this, at this speed. With a bit of a climb by the looks of it, let me see. No, we're about level. So, you know, you want to have this sort of view where you can glance at stuff. Look at that speed going to 170 knots. We're at uh, 2,700 feet. Anyway, I want to head over here and see if I can find myself a carrier. I thought for sure it was just off my bow here. I could be on the wrong end of the island. I could be. <laughs> I didn't realize. Oh, yeah, I circled around, so it's going to be back this way. Anyway, that's, uh, that's getting you going. Now we're flying, now we're having fun, and now we just use the plane as you normally would any other plane. We've cleaned everything up, we've pulled up the gear. There are no flaps for takeoff. Flaps are only for landing. And when we use the flaps, they're gonna be heavy duty. 
those flaps are going to really, um, they're really going to give us a kick. I mean, we're going to slow down so fast that we're going to have to really watch what we're doing. All right, so we want to just check, check print oh, look at this, temperature and pressures. We've got ourselves a really hot cylinder head. Let me see if I can keep this level. We'll look down here, and you can see the temperature is up really high. And if you look on the outside of the plane, our cow flaps are not open. I'll show you what they look like when they're open. So here we go. We're going to go and open them. Click. And now the cow flaps are actually opening. And you can see that right around the cowl. Let's just zoom right in here. Right there, you can see the flaps are now open right there. They're letting the hot air out. See by the scorching going on here. Make sure I'm not flying erratically. I'm looking for an aircraft carrier. You think I would know where it is? There it is. I see it. It's over that way. I knew it was back toward the island. Okay, and the cow flaps, and a really nice view here. You can see the cow flaps are open, looking good. And you'll see that temperature come back, you guys. Take a look over here. We're, we're not really pushing this hard. It's a normal cruise, and that temperature will fall back down here. You'll see it fall back. It's still okay. Maximum, maximum allowable is 260, and we're still under that, so we're not bad. I'm sure the aircraft carrier's out this way. And we'll go straight over the tower of the aircraft carrier, and then we'll do a circuit. We'll come in and land. That gives you an idea how it works. We're going to be playing with some flaps as we get there. Remember on a downwind, you do your downwind checks, um, flaps, fuel pump on, um, landing light on, certainly your gear. I mean, you know, all the things that we need to do on downwind to get ready. Now, I'm not going to be putting flaps down on downwind because they really do affect it. Now, I'm at 2,000 feet. This is at sea level. The circuit height will be around 1,000, so I'm going to just descend as we're going here, and I'm going to pull back some power as we're descending. You can see we're moving in on that thing really fast. I'm going to go right over the tower. They'll see me coming by. Certainly not going to buzz the tower as much as everybody wants to do that. Come on, Howard, buzz the tower. The pattern is full. But, you know, we'll, we'll just uh, go straight past it here. This is where we're going to land. Uh, I have to figure out which way we're going to land. Okay, we're going to land from the right side. Okay. So we're just going to do a, a turn here. There's our baby. And where it says the word Lex is where we're coming in. So we're going to be coming in around there. So we'll have to figure it out from here. All right, I'm coming up on 1,000, or coming down to 1,000. I'm going to trim it, put some power back on, and keep it here. And I'm going to do a parallel to parallel to it. Let's have a look and see where it is. Right back there. It looks pretty parallel. Okay, we'll find out as we go along. All right, so there we are, around a thousand. Give it some more power. I'm not putting flaps down. And we'll level that off. There we go. And now I'm going to put gear down. Do a normal checklist for gear down. I didn't even drop a bomb yet, so we'll stop, we'll take off again, and then we'll go drop a bomb somewhere, just so you can see that in action. And it's cranking away down here. You can hear it down there, sorry. And it's lowering the gear. Imagine that, they had to do that manually. All right, gear is down. We've got a landing light on. And we've got fuel on. And we're going in for landing. All right, turning base and slowing down. Now, at this point, I'm putting my blue lever all the way forward. You have to do a go around. You leave it forward, and now we're just adjusting with throttle. Let's have a look at that. What are we seeing over there? Way back there. Boy, we were really moving while I'm talking away. So let's sort of line up with the island end here. Stay it at a thousand or 750 maybe. Don't want to get too low this far out. If we had an engine failure. We're putting it in the in the water, and there's our target over there on the left where we're going to be landing. Pretty much like this. A little bit more power. I don't want to go any lower than that. A thousand feet. And we can pretty much start our turn now. So just giving you an idea, you guys have probably done carrier landings before. With more powerful jets. This is very easy. And now on this turning final, I put my tail hook down. 
everything is ready except flaps. So we're going to see how the flaps work here. You're going to see it'll take about 10 to 15 seconds for the flaps to fully deploy. But this isn't good with the, with the sun. Good challenge for later, but I'm going to change that for the moment. Put that up higher in the sky so we have a better visual of what we're doing here. There it is. We're coming in on it. Let me think about what we're doing here. That is not the right approach. Let's come back around this way. We'll stay at a thousand or so. And I realized that we had to do a full circuit all the way around. So um, keep the con on your right. Keep the con on your right as you're approaching. So right now I'm approaching, the con is on my left, the, the tower is on my left, the runway's on the right. So that's not the right way, you're coming in the wrong side, right? This is the departure side. So we're gonna come in on this side here. All right, so we'll just do them, we're pretty tight here too, but you can see that visually now, yep. So when I came over from the island, I could have just turned left and gone in and landed. Here I did a complete full circuit all the way around the aircraft carrier. There she be. Now because I'm already set up for the landing, I don't have to go too far out now. Am I still around? Oh, I'm around 700, so I've got to be careful. A little bit more power. I've got gear out, so it's going to, you know, that's going to give us more drag. Let's look back here if we can. should see it. Nope, can't see it anymore. All right, so what we're going to do is just turn from here. I'm going to put full flaps on as I turn to final. Because full flaps, I mean turning flaps on, they just drop. And this thing, you have to give it more power just to bring it in. It could drop right into the water, which I've done already in my tests. All right, there we're turning around. We're going on base. Like this, making sure we're high enough. Oh, we're plenty high enough. The water just seems like it's close, right? And then that should be it. Square that up. Yeah, I'm really high. All right, so that's okay. I can pull, I pulled back some power now. There's where we want to go. And I'm going to give it flaps. I've done a whole lot of these landings and done them with perfect squares <laughs> until you go to record. All right, flaps are coming down. I just push the flap switch and flaps will really slow me down. I've got a nice angle going in. Flaps are coming down. You can see the, the wedge there behind the main wing. And now I want to line up and head there. I've got my catapult out. I've got flaps on. I'm going to just use power to get there now. What's my speed like? I'm at 120. That's not bad. A little bit more power to get me up. Don't pull back to get up. Just more power. Set the target. Here we go. Going in. A little bit steep. You don't want to hit the edge of the thing. Pull back power and catch the wire. And it pulls me back a bit. There we go. And what I like about the catapult is I may not have been exactly where the arrestor wires were, but as a beginner, this really helps build the confidence. All right, now from here, don't forget to take the catapult hook, uh, the hook, sorry, not the catapult hook, the tail hook, we're probably calling it the catapult hook, the tail hook has to be taken off before you take off again, or else it'll cause some grief, it'll be dragging the, the back of the, the plane. I'm going to leave the emergency fuel pump on while I'm, while I'm sitting here idling, and believe it or not, from this position, I can take off, even though I'm this far past the wires, look at that. Now normally you would turn it around, come back toward the wires, take off from there. Um, this isn't your conventional modern aircraft carrier where you have four catapult areas out front. Here, this is typically where these kinds of planes would take off. And so what we're going to do now is take off from here. Let's see what our temperature's like. Still up there. Hasn't really come back much, but at least it's not going overboard. And uh, what we've got now, just so you can see, we're going to make sure that this is all forward like it was. We're going to make sure mixture is all forward like it was. Oops, I pulled it back and stopped the engine. <laughs> this to demonstrate. Prop clear. Oof. I think it's a little warm. What do you think? All right, we're good. Whew. And uh, and the next thing we want to do is we're going to catapult off of here. You've seen it once already, and we're going to do it from right here. Now, on the runway, I don't use this, but I did just for demonstration purposes back there for beginners. It's a good way to do it, but I wouldn't attempt a normal takeoff from here. You probably can't get fast enough. All right, I think everything else is set. Fuel is on. Flaps are off. Yeah, right. Let's do our checks. 
flaps are off. Look at those great big flaps. Now there is an indicator on the flaps right there. Do you see that red indicator disappearing back there? As it disappears, that means the flaps are all up. That's the only way that the pilot can tell flaps are down or up because it is a split flap. It's underneath the wing, you can't see it. So that little indicator helps you understand that it's already there. We are all set for takeoff. If you give it full power now, it could nose over. So I'm just gonna give it some power that without it nosing over and I'll give it full power as I hit this switch over here. You ready, set? Go. Oops, did it work? I want to jump back down again. Yep, it's working. And make sure you have your full power on. I almost didn't. I didn't think it worked and it was starting to work already. So now we're working. Gear up. As soon as possible. Bring that gear up. I'm going to leave the, f the flaps open here. And then now just to show you the, the effect of the bombs, you guys, and the guns. Well, the guns are easy enough. We'll do a strafing run first. I see that there's, you know, as a, as a test, it doesn't hurt anything. I'm not blowing anything up. I'm not going to wreck anything. But to test your accuracy, I should be able to have... It's right there. Uh, gun sight on or off? It should be on. I have no gun sight. Huh. should be a gun sight right here on my... Okay, maybe not. Pull back some power here. 29 and 21. 22. Normal. I see a ship right there. We'll say that it's an enemy ship coming into our base. So now I'm just going to use my stick and just hit it. Just using guns. Use little bursts. And then up we go. Full power. I'm going to come around and I'm going to drop a bomb. It's just a nice effect, you guys, and you know, it doesn't do any damage. We're not blowing planes out of the sky, we're not blowing ships up and making them sink. Um, horrible stuff, but you know, it's testing your ability to. It's just a fun animation, and you know, you have to use it judiciously. A lot, there's going to be a lot of kids that are going to just love this, and then they're going to hate it because you can't blow anything up. But, uh, it doesn't have to be used, and you can certainly unarm them. So there we see a ship. Now the best thing to do again would be to come long ways at it, but I'm going to come this way, and I'm going to release the bombs. All right, can I actually see that in action? Probably the outside view would be best. Like that, maybe like that, and then sort of let the bomb go. There, my left one just left. I can't follow it down. Let's come around and do the right one. All right, so the right one, I'm back in back into the cockpit right there and we'll change the leverage for the right one there in the middle would be both bombs there now we got the oops now we got the right one set there this is horrible because you're sitting here with your mouse in the cockpit and your plane could be crashing you know it's not healthy so you want to be able to go reach down and click it real quick all right let's see if we can pull this off again some kind of view from the outside Coming back around, heading over towards the enemy ship that's coming into the harbor. Pulling back some power. As I dive, it's going to increase my speed anyway. And as I head toward it, I've already got a button for that, so I'm going to go to the outside so we can try to see it again. So the outside view, we're heading in. We're going to drop that right bomb now because I've got it set for the right bomb. Lining it up. Looking through the viewfinder, if you could, inside the plane. But watch it drop now, and then I'll try to look down. So here we go. Ready, set, and drop. There it goes. Falling down. Whoosh. Right about there. Now I'm going to crash trying to follow it. Anyway, it went down toward the ground. Beautiful stuff. And then, you know, full power. Victory roll. Maybe not a victory roll. That's when people get in trouble. All right, let's go back and land properly. If you look at your checklist, it'll show you your landing checklist, of course, the things that we were just doing. Let's just come back this way and head toward the runway. We could just go in on that runway, but we'll come around. Before landing, approach lights off above 10,000. Oh, wow. Before landing, here we go. Landing light on, approach lights on. Everything set back to neutral, tailwheel locked. Let's do that first while I try to get control of the plane here. 
All right, so we're not going to use the tail lock, the tail hook. We're not going to use that, but we are going to make sure it's locked. The tail wheel is locked. It's locked the whole time. You take off with it like that, and you land with it like that. Oof. We got into some cloud. Not healthy. It's a visual. We're doing a visual here. Anyway, we'll clear through it. Um, now we can see the landing flaps in the down position. Well, first, let's get the gear down. Gear's coming down. You can hear it clicking away there. Tail wheel is locked. Flaps will come on soon. All right, everything else is set to neutral. Landing light is on. And let me see if I've got my attitude set properly again. Yep. It's, yeah, while you're messing around with checklists and in the cockpit, you could easily crash because you could just kind of, oops. And I found myself, you know, look, trying to look at that bomb I was actually going forward to. <laughs> Just trying to see the victory shot, you know. Now pretty high up, so I'm going to come back down now. What am I at? I'm going to again. I want to come in around a thousand. You know, use your normal approach kind of idea. I'm going to actually do a. I'm going to do a, a break to land. Just to you know, because we're way up anyway. Right over that way is where we're headed. One of those runways. I'm going to do a break to land and come back around this way. So let's set this again. That was my takeoff power. I'm set for 29 and 22. The 22, you notice I'm glancing forward, then I'm coming back and adjusting things like that. Doing a break to land. So, it's, so there's the runway I'm going to land on right there. I'll just fly over top of the, the airport. We're less than a thousand, so I'm pulling up a bit, a little more power. Having a look over there. Tail hook as required. All right, let me just minimize that so we can see what we're doing. There's where we're going to land. I'm going to come around like this and do a break to land. So midfield, circuit height or or above, descend to circuit height, which will be a thousand. There's my runway. Looks like uh, 23, probably the one we took off from. Try to keep your circuit height around a thousand here. And uh, the, my gear is already lowered. The only thing I got to do is flaps now, you guys. My emergency fuel pump is on. My propeller lever is full forward. And I'll just adjust with my throttle now. And we're pretty much past. Around we go. Keeping around 1,000 for now. Hard to do over the water, you guys. It's very misleading, especially that glare off the windshield. And we just do the reciprocal of 23. I'm just doing it by ear, you guys, or by, by sight, but it's pretty much like that. You can look down here and find your reciprocal for 23, which will be somewhere around 6 or something. There we go. Are we still at 1,000? Good. Everything has been checked now. All our checklist items are done. Trims are set back to neutral. I'm going completely by throttle and by pitch, and I'm around 1,000. There's the threshold of the runway. Typically, where you slow down, we'll go to a 45 degree to the runway, and away we go. Now to break the land, you don't square it up, you just kind of circle around, so that's what I'm going to do now. And as I circle, as I'm getting closer to the runway, I'm going to turn the, f I'm going to put the flaps down. You'll need lots of power. Those flaps are a huge drag on the plane. As I'm turning like this now, using a little bit of left rudder to make that a coordinated turn, watch my altitude. There's the runway coming, now I'm doing flaps. I've learned to do flaps a little later in the approach because they are such a big drag. Watch this, the speed drop down. I'm now at 130. There's my runway. As that gets down to about 110, we gotta give it more power just to keep it there. There's a runway, okay, we'll do that. And we'll give it a bit more power, we're at 110, a bit more power. Just to speed over to uh, compensate for the extra drag. Because once you flare, this thing will pretty much stop. I don't have the, the tail hook on, though I'm going to do a proper landing. Once you touch down, you can see I'm actually losing altitude here. Speed. Okay, I'll just pick up a bit of altitude with pitch. It'll drop my speed where it should be. And then I'll pull back some power right about here. Once your wheels touch, you want to get that tail wheel on the ground and hold the stick back. All right, less power. Less power, all the way to middle. Hold the stick back, hold it back, flaring, hold it back, on the ground, 
Hold it back. That's your brakes. Both brakes at the same time. Or use one of them to correct your direction like I just did to the left. Both brakes, both brakes. And which, watch it when you finish because it'll actually hold the wheel back. It will nose over. There we go. And there we are landed, you guys. Now, it's crooked. Take a look straight back. Yeah, I drifted to the right. I was correcting, but once I got into this open area of the, the cross runways, I kind of lost my direction. But, you know, you don't want to be heading towards those planes. All right, flaps up while I'm taxiing. And while I'm taxiing, you notice I still have a locked tail wheel. So, let's clean it up. We want to unlock the tail wheel. <clears throat> Flaps up, as I mentioned. Landing light off, you're going to blind people. Taxi light if you really need it. Our mixture and our blue lever, our mixture and propeller are full forward. And we're just going to taxi using throttle and stick all the way back. Look at my stick. I'm going to keep it all the way back the whole time. I'm going to use differential braking. All right. I started to move while I was talking. Differential braking to turn right. And to get in here where all the rest of the planes are, kind of hang out with them. I'm just going to pull it straight ahead. Remember, stick all the way back. Left and right. Yeah, look at that. Well, you really got to give it a burst. I don't want to hit that plane, so let's just stop right here. Not the best parking spot. But uh, I shouldn't come in here with a bunch of planes like this and expect to spin around. But uh, let's just put the parking brake on now. So that's control period if you want to use that. There is no parking brake in the real plane, so we use that to put the chocks on. So you could say control period for chocks. All right, and there the chocks are on. Let it cool down if it has to. Just like in, you know, like in Reno races, when they take old planes like this and they start racing them, they let them do a, a cool down circuit at the airport. Same sort of thing here, right? All right, so I can see that the temperature's right up there. So I just want to keep the propeller going, the cowl flaps open and let the thing cool down at idle or around this, this uh, RPM. Maybe around there some airflow going. All right, I don't have to hold the tow brakes, but while you're on the ground, and even while you're taxiing, you can open up the canopy. Here we go. Get some air in here. You can actually hear it's louder. Wow. So that gives you the demonstration, you guys. Uh, an idea you can scrub through, of course, as you might have done for any one of these positions or any one of these things. After landing checklist, tail hook, we didn't need it. Landing flaps are up. The tail wheel is unlocked. We're good. Landing lights off. Smoke generator is off. We didn't use the smoke generator. Landing flaps. By the way, the smoke generator is two places. Either this switch here. I can, oops. I just opened the door even more. Great. If I can click it. Did I turn it on? There we go. And if you look behind the plane now, we have smoke. Oh, that doesn't show smoke. Yeah, there is some. That's kind of nuts. Thought I'd see more than that. Typically you can see smoke while you're sitting on the ground. Wow. No smoke. Uh, I also noticed there's another spot to do smoke is right here and uh, aerobatic smoke is actually on or the ability to use it. Yeah, smoke generator's on. Huh. And then you would shut down and close the canopy. Yeah. Let me just do, and you just take the propeller lever, fuel selector off right here and propeller lever pulled to zero. And the propeller lever at zero, generator switch off, parking brakes and the tail wheel locked. So let me just close that for a minute. I'm just going to somehow get out of here. It doesn't look promising. It could be messy. Put myself in. Let's go try some smoke, you guys. I'm going to just use my ability to let's go this way just take off do some smoke come back down again just to see that in action right. back in the plane bear with me there we go that's locked for takeoff the pumps on we're good flaps are up mixture and propeller is full and now here's my throttle okay Let's do catapult launch. No, let's do a normal launch. I don't think we did a normal launch yet. 
Maybe not. That way. All right. Chalks out. Chalks are off. I can see myself starting to move. And full power. Stick all the way back. All the way back. All the way back. Get that tail. Just keep that tail wheel on the ground. When we start to fly, a little correction there before we lift it off. Notice the sound of the wind while the canopy is open. Level off here, pick up some more speed. There we go, 130 knots, we're safe. And let's see if we've got smoke going, you guys. We got smoke, so it's not going to let that happen on the ground. I'm surprised. I'm sure I stopped and then there was a bunch of smoke behind me. Taking a look behind now, there's our smoke trail. Very handy. Some kind of safe altitude that I can pull this off. Yeah, around a thousand. Why not? That's our deck. Okay. Heading down. It's dangerous over water. Look at this. At 500 feet, I can see the ripples of the waves. <laughs> In the sim, you can take these chances. There we go. Smoke all over the place. Can he do it? Well, this is where you guys get to see what the simulator's for. It should come out around 500. Yeah, 400 maybe. Okay. And we look back again, and we see our loop. Oh, I can't see the loop anymore. It's gone. Anyway, that's it. That's our smoke, you guys. That's handy. Uh, you can also drop those um, those tanks. And actually, I remember Andrew saying when you drop the tanks, you can see the, the fuel trail. So we should try that before we go in for a landing, you guys. Let's drop the tanks over the base so that they can recover them. I think they float. Last time I ditched the plane in the water to see what that was like. I think they were floating. Let me bring the gear up for, before we do that. And then now to drop the tanks, there is a key bind, which I don't have. But you can drop them over here, I think. You can drop them right here. I think if you open up these guys. Oh, I can't, I don't think I can do it. But that's the key bind that we were talking about earlier. You can actually drop the tanks. All right, I might as well come back in for a landing. You've already seen the landing, so you don't need to see anymore. I'm going to turn smoke off right there. And uh, I should be able to see there's no smoke on now. There's my smoke trail back there. Great for aerobatics, but when you're doing an air show. And uh, I'll go back in and land. Power. You're down. Wheels on. Need the hook. Everything set. Landing lights on. See what I mean? I look away. And uh, come back, and I've got a nose-high attitude, so you never know. Let me come in on this runway here. We'll power off completely, putting flaps on. Coming down real fast. See what our speed's like. Here, I'm pulling up the nose just to lose speed, you guys. It's coming down to 120. Here should be down by now. Giving a bit of power, because as I descend here... And let's see if we can pull this one off. Look how short that runway is. And I'm doing it without without the hook. It's almost going to pancake in. I better give it a bit more power. Let's try that. We're off. Go back. As soon as I touch, get those brakes on. It's pretty smooth. It's pretty short runway. I've got this stick all the way back. Keep that nose wheel on the uh, sorry tail wheel on the ground, and that's a good landing. Not bad. Look pretty short from the sky. All right, that's it, you guys. We can put it away from now for now. But what we would typically do is just pull back on the mixture lever. That kills the engine. There's no fuel at all, of course. I thought that was a bit abrupt compared to other engines, but that's fine. It works great. Lock the tail wheel. If you remember the checklist, it is locked. Close the canopy and exit. Canopy is here. 
And then one last one. There we go. Oops, one last one. Beautiful. That's locked up. Of course, you'd want to get out first, right? And then, uh, and then um, parking brake if you were at a parking spot. There we go. There, chocks are on. Everything's shut off. All switches are off. Every lever's off. We're good.